Good afternoon and welcome to the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health webinar entitled Environmental Health Disparities. My name is Sima Finn and I'm a program administrator at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Division of Extramural Research and Training. I will be the moderator for today's session, but I wanted to acknowledge the coordinator of the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health program, Liam O'Fallon, for organizing this session today. I'm very pleased to introduce our presenters for today, Dr. Peggy Reynolds and Dr. Tu Quach of the Cancer Prevention Institute of California, Wig Zamor of the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, and Dr. Christina Fuller of Georgia State University. The first presentation will be given by Drs. Reynolds and Quach. Dr. Reynolds is a senior research scientist at the Cancer Preventer Institute of California. Her primary research interests have focused on social and environmental influences in the etiology of cancer. She has conducted a number of occupational epidemiology studies, including a study of malignant melanoma among Lawrence Livermore Laboratory employees, cancer incidents among California teachers, and cancer incidents among flight attendants. Dr. Reynolds was a co-investigator for a multi-center study that has become one of the most influential human health studies on the risk of lung cancer from secondhand smoke. The landmark publications from this study have figured prominently in national and international assessments of secondhand smoke as a cause of lung cancer in non-smokers and have provided some of the critical underpinnings for the dramatic changes in public policy over the last decade regarding regulating smoking in the workplace. She's one of the founding members of the California Teachers Study, a large ongoing prospective study of 133,479 women established in 1995. Within this cohort study, she's examining air pollution, secondhand smoke, and persistent organic pollutants in relation to cancer risk. Dr. Quach's primary research interest has focused on immigrant populations and the environmental, occupational, and sociocultural factors that may influence their health. She has conducted a number of studies focusing on occupational exposure, health and safety in nail salon workers, many of whom are Vietnamese immigrants. Her research in this area has influenced local, state, and national policies and has helped to promote workplace change. In addition to her role as SYNC research scientist at the Cancer Preventer Institute of California, Dr. Quach is the research director at Asian Health Services, a community health center in Oakland, California's Chinatown, serving low-income patients, many of whom are Asian immigrants and Pacific Islanders. She has a strong commitment to community-based participatory research and has worked with different advocacy, environmental, and community-based organizations to leverage public health goals that promote the health and well-being of underserved populations. Dr. Reynolds and Quach. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about our work on this morning's uh, webinar. Um, I will uh, start out by giving a very brief project overview. Um, then turn it over to two to give a little more detail about that, um, some information about results of this project, uh, and a word or two about conclusions and next steps. Starting with project overview, uh, this was designed as a community-based participatory research project with, with the objective to identify and characterize neighborhood level environmental hazards and health barriers for a Vietnamese population in California. I should say that this was funded as one of the uh, challenge grants from NIEHS uh, to address the challenge area of health disparities and in response to the challenge topic, building trust between researchers through capacity building and environmental public health. As such, our primary purpose was to develop strong partnerships between researchers and community members to promote environmental public health. 
So as I mentioned, the target population was Vietnamese Americans, uh, with a, a special emphasis on hair and nail salon workers, because this really uh, was designed to build upon ongoing work uh, around promoting worker health and safety in the nail and hair care sector. Um, we targeted four areas of California. Bringing up the map now, these are uh, were areas with high density of Vietnamese populations. If you're familiar with California, you may know about Little Saigon and Orange County, and the very high dense Vietnamese populations in Santa Clara and Alameda County. Uh, what may seem unusual to you is the inclusion of Marin County, uh, not necessarily known for um, environmental health disparities, but as we learned in the process of working with our community partners, it's actually an area of um, there's an area of Marin County that is very densely populated by new immigrant populations and uh, where there are a number of environmental justice issues at play. Um, so the partnership really uh, came under the umbrella of our ongoing work in the Cal as part of the, the Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative. Um, and a close partnership between uh, CPIC and Asian Health Services in Oakland. Um, Asian Health Services actually um, embraced and incorporated uh, participation from several uh, CBOs in California representing each of the four geographic areas of interest, which in turn recruited community members to participate in this project. And so the project was designed to be um, somewhat iterative, certainly circular. Um, we began with the community uh, with focus groups to identify specific concerns, um, moved that on into the community audit, which we'll discuss with you in a little more detail. We trained community members. Um, together, we selected audit areas, conducted the survey, and then um, we conducted a series of debriefings along with our partners, the community auditors, who then joined us to circle back to the general community to present at community forums in each of the four areas of study. As part of phase one, we conducted 16 focus groups with Vietnamese community members. Uh, we uh, conducted them in each of the four regions of interest and um, different age groups. We wanted to get input and insights from youth, from the elderly, and in general from adults in the community. There were a total of 94 participants across those groups. As part of the focus group process, we used topic guides to um, elicit information about community perceived economic environmental, social, and built environmental stressors, as well as health access barriers, and um, to really get a flavor of what the participants thought about environmental concerns and health. Phase two, and the, the primary activity for this project, was the community audit. We um, ended up training 66 community members to conduct surveys of the neighborhoods where they live, work, and play. Uh, the objectives really were to characterize differences in those neighborhoods in uh, a host of factors, economic, environmental, social, and uh, built environmental stressors, and also to raise the consciousness of participants through the process where they collected data about their own neighborhoods. As part of that process, we um, identified uh, both work and home areas uh, and areas, um, some additional areas that community members identified as being particularly important for their own communities. And then we selected audit segments uh, based on uh, one of those uh, areas and trying to get a balance between residential and business areas. And just to give you an idea, here is um, an audit map uh, selecting the street segments for um, one of the audit groups um, in Marin County. And so with that, I think I will um, turn this over to two to give you a little more detail about the nature of the community audit and um, some uh, a, a few snippets of results. 
Uh, for those of you on the webinar, uh, two actually is pictured <laughs> here as the left-hand partner and setting up a community audit survey. So two. Thanks, Peggy. Um, so uh, again, I just want to go over what a community audit is. And here we have just pictures of our, some of our staff posing in our very fashionable uh, orange vest um, there that we also have the community auditors wear for their own safety. Um, but we usually encourage folks to go in uh, pairs or in groups of three. Um, and what we would ask during, for them to do during the audit was really to do this photo voice process where they actually took pictures in the, in the segments where they were assigned um, of things that they thought were important um, or negative. So the first person um, on the left would write down, log down what they took and why they thought it was important, whether it's a positive or a negative. Uh, the person in the middle um, is holding a camera where she or he would take a picture of um, something and then also press the GPS button so that we know where the pictures were taken. And then the third person is actually completing the community audit survey, which we'll go over in a little bit, and also call, um, carrying a black carbon monitor. Um, right, uh, I think she's carrying it by um, the little bag, the blue bag that you see. And that's a really small um, real-time um, sensor that allows us to detect some of the black carbon. So why black carbon? Uh, black carbon comes from the burning of fossil fuels, biofuels and biomass. Um, it's, it's caused some health concerns because it's a really, it's a suit part, particulate that's really small and can deposit in the lungs. And it's an, often an indicator of exposures to diesel exhaust, which has been classified as a toxic air contaminant, as well as a probable human carcinogen. Um, in California, we have, I think, three stationary monitors um, only that's really doing all this real-time collection. So there's not a lot in terms of data collected around uh, black carbon, even though it's been an emerging concern. In terms of our community audit survey, we actually um, based it upon an existing uh, audit survey developed for the aging population from the St. Louis University School of Public Health, but we made some modifications based on what our findings were from our focus group. Um, here you see some pictures of the community audit. Um, we took um, information around, you know, whether it was a resident, what kind of residential areas um, and buildings were there. Uh, we also took, um, we also have them write down uh, food destinations, uh, retail places like gas stations, um, auto repair shops, nail salons, uh, dry cleaners, and also recreational facilities. Um, and then here um, are some of the audit survey items that came from our focus group. There really, uh, there were con some concerns around idling trucks or buses, which really contribute to black carbon uh, levels. So we have them note that. Um, one of the themes that came from the focus group was around neighborhood safety. And so we had them document things around graffiti, uh, broken cars and glasses. Metal bars on windows of storefronts were really important. Um, and also another thing that came out in some of the regions was around secondhand smoking and the high smoking rates in the Vietnamese population. So what we try to do is capture things around cigarette and tobacco advertisements as well as cigarette butts on the ground. Um, the other theme was around litter. And so um, a lot of the community members talked about uh, littering. And so we had them kind of take pictures as well as document uh, litter that they saw in the uh, yards as well as in the streets. So what would we ask um, auditors to do during the process? Here is an example uh, of uh, what uh, a street segment may look like. And you often would have uh, two, possibly three auditors carrying their survey as well as their camera. And what we ask them to do is walk down the street um, and cross over and just circle back to where they started, really giving them the, the time to really observe their surroundings, really um, take note of things and take pictures before they started completing the audit survey. 
And then when they're done with that, they, we have them walk the middle of the segment and actually conduct a five-minute car and truck count. So they would count the number of cars and trucks that pass by in five minutes on one side of the street. Here is a breakdown of our community auditors by the four regions that we focus on, as well as the number of audit segments that they conducted, and then also the breakdown of men and women in our community um, auditors. Um, you see a lot more women participating in this. Uh, some, some brief results for us. Again, the, the issue around metal bars on storefronts uh, to indicate some issues around neighborhood safety. Here are some pictures taken in various areas, including in Oakland. And here is a graph. Um, these are, we, we intentionally showed you the same graphs that we presented back at the community forum so you get a flavor of what we were presenting back to the community. Um, you really see here that uh, over 50% of the uh, street segments that were done in Alameda actually had metal bars on their stores, much less in the other regions. Graffiti was another issue, and you see some pictures here taken by our auditors. Um, here you have the breakdown of the four counties again, and you see it's a little higher in Orange County in Santa Clara and close, uh, closely in Alameda, and less so in the Marin County area. Cigarette butts, um, again showing some of the concerns around secondhand smoking. Um, here are some pictures there. And then you see sort of um, some of the cigarette butts. Um, and they're somewhat comparable across the four counties, um, led mostly by Alameda. Pictures of litter on the street, some very interesting pictures taken by our auditors. We had a, a whole array of pictures that we took about all kinds of litter that they saw in the, in the neighborhoods where they audited. And you really see again that there, you know, in Alameda, there's a, about 70% of the street segments that they did that actually had um, uh, litter in it, and then closely followed by Orange County and Santa Clara. I should say that we're, in no way are we suggesting that the neighborhood segments are representative of the entire county. Again, these segments were selected based on the addresses of where our auditors, auditors live work or what they noted were important in their community because we really wanted them to conduct an audit that they were familiar with and neighborhoods where they were familiar with. Um, tobacco ads, here's a picture taken by one of our auditors around some of the um, storefronts uh, with a lot of tobacco ads on it. There wasn't a huge amount, you know, here you see a scale of 0 to 10 percent, but in Orange County we saw, we saw it a lot uh, more than in other areas. I should say that in our focus groups, the, the overriding theme that came out, particularly among our young adults, was around smoking that's being taken up by uh, some of the young Vietnamese. And so it's interesting that we saw this. Here uh, are box plots of the five-minute car count, and you can see that overall, on average, there are um, about the same number of car counts that we were seeing, except in some areas, like in Orange County, you see as much as 150 over a five-minute count. So, you know, um, on average, are the same, but in some regions, there is a lot more traffic. Five-minute truck count. Um, again, they're similar, except Orange County really does stand out in this one more so than some of the others. Um, here is a picture of the black carbon concentrations um, that were taken. And on average, um, the, uh, the different uh, counties, um, the neighborhoods in each of those counties were similar um, not, but there are usually around 1.0 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Um, interesting enough, we actually show you the statewide um, uh, measurements. Again, those are based on the three stationary monitors that California has for weekdays, and it is below one, suggesting that when you do these community collected um, audits where you're walking, it may have different numbers 
than what you would see if you're using some of the uh, existing data collected by the government. And this really came out as a big theme for us that, you know, as researchers, if we came in relying on those stationary monitors, we often may be underestimating the exposures. Um, another, um, another table showing the four counties, and in parentheses next to the counties, you see the county median levels. Um, again, they were close to one. However, when we um, started um, zooming into certain neighborhoods, you see that certain neighborhoods, neighborhoods actually had peak concentrations that were 10 times often even more than what we were reading from the county, really, again, underscoring this issue around um, variation in terms of black carbon exposure. And we definitely don't want to forget the positives that were really noted by our auditors. Here you have some pictures taken in Marin about showing the diversity in the neighborhood, um, faith communities, um, water. This is Lake Merritt in Oakland where um, people often like to exercise around. Um, Again, a lot of greeneries in there. Um, a library taken by uh, one of our auditors. Um, Kaiser, a healthcare um, place for them. Um, and, and trash cans to really suggest um, the, the sort of promotion of, of, of not littering. Um, and uh, Laney College, which is one of the um, community colleges there. Um, our auditor's experience, which was really key for us in, in all of this, was that they really expressed that they were proud to be a part of the project and to have contributed to the research that benefits the community. They, really, they told us they had a lot of fun doing it, going out there and exercising while they're taking note of their neighborhoods. And it really provided them with an opportunity to meet new people and to make friends, really the social network type of theme. Um, after the project, others thought that they were more aware of their environment. You know, and this really came out in the focus groups when we first started asking them questions around environmental health. And a lot of the participants who were saying, well, we really don't think about it that much, but as the theme started coming out around traffic and trash and pollution, um, their consciousness was really raised and they started asking a lot more questions, both in terms of the focus group as well as the community audit process. The auditors who were recent immigrants who participated um, really enjoyed this because they felt like they could meet new people and get to know their community. Um, many of them said they would love to participate again. Uh, one thing we were really happy about was they felt this ownership of the data and the project. Um, oftentimes, you would look at the data from each of the region and realize, oh, well, maybe we should um, collect more data because this one seems a little bit high. We just want to make sure about it. And when we brought this up to the um, community-based agencies and the auditors themselves, they would often volunteer to do this, really indicating this ownership and, and wanting to have really good data to present back to the community. Uh, when it came to presenting uh, at the uh, community forums, they, um, many of them volunteered to co-present with, um, with our team as well as with the community um, organizations. And a number of them have asked, well, what's next? You know, we, we started doing this, um, we want to do more. So we're, we're in discussions about future projects that have community engagement in it. Conclusions really around this issue of community collected data, highlighting neighborhood level aesthetics, uh, neighborhood safety, litter, traffic, um, sidewalk conditions, and air quality as major community concerns. Um, community auditors really help to identify contribute factors to environmental hazards. During the debriefing sessions, we would show them, oh, well, here is, here is a, a neighborhood where we really saw some high concentrations of black carbon. And they would tell us, well, that's interesting because that's where a lot of the school buses come, or that's where we have a lot of the outing trucks. Same thing around graffiti. Like, well, what, what, what would be reasons why there would be um, graffiti? They really offer these explanations around, you know, um, uh, feelings around gangs and or feelings around youth really feeling displaced and wanting to have 
place of belonging. So we really looked to them to explain a lot of the data that we saw. Uh, we saw differences between community collected snapshot data and government monitoring data, which can help us uh, which can help inform us on future research that we do. And it really provides the community with data that they can be used to address local environmental concerns. There's already been discussions about bringing it to their local council uh, to address things like sidewalk conditions and all that. So, you know, we really are encouraging them to use this data. And it really helps to build positive relationships with the project participants as well as our community partners. Next steps, uh, we've actually been really busy. We've um, actually submitted several papers, one led by our community partner um, around community engagement process, um, and we're continuing to work on a few others. We have also are finalizing our fact sheets that uh, we're going to be giving to our community agencies. We'll pass it around to the community so that we really are honoring this idea that whatever we find, we really report back to the community. And we're in discussions for applying for future grants that um, utilize a similar method of community engagement and focusing on environmental public health action. In the last minute, I really do want to give a shout out to our different community-based organizations that were part of this um, project, that they really were at the helm of this and engaging the community. I think some of them are on the calls, and again, I just want to acknowledge them for all their hard work and hope for continued partnership in all of this. Well, thank you, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Quach. The first question that we did receive asks, what is the environmental health disparity? How did your research study address environmental health disparity in the communities you studied? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that when we started engaging in this, it really was this issue, particularly with the Asian American Pacific Islander community in terms of, you know, often we go out to address these huge um, environmental disparities that seems like, oh, well, it's very obvious that there is something. But what's come up is, well, what happens when we're not sure? No one's really out there monitoring if there are disparities. And this project really gets at that. You know, we were looking into some of the, the enclave areas where Vietnamese populations live, and we wanted them to be able to um, collect the data and identify if there are disparities. And in, in the results that we saw, we saw that there definitely are some differences in the black carbon levels for certain neighborhoods. Um, we're looking more and more into that, but we definitely found some, some differences depending on certain neighborhoods in terms of air quality. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we do have another question. Um, how can you compare communities when areas surveyed were not representative? Were there other more rigorous comparisons that you can make? I, you know, um, I will just start that off and then um, hand it over to two. I think uh, keeping in mind that the objective of this project really was to engage partnerships with uh, Vietnamese communities to better characterize the neighborhoods in which these people lived and worked. Uh, that uh, clearly, for instance, in the, um, the Marin uh, Vietnamese community, which is a, which has lots of new immigrant um, groups, including a very large uh, Latino population, uh, the characteristics of those neighborhoods are not representative of the characteristics of neighborhoods in Marin County in general. So we were really trying to start uh, from a grassroots ground up level in terms of people uh, characterizing their own neighborhoods. So yes, it may not be representative of all of the neighborhoods of Vietnamese communities in California, or all, certainly not of all communities in California, uh, but it, this is part of some ongoing grassroots work that we have been doing um, with this population. You want to add anything? Yeah, and I think, I think here you really have to build up, you know, to ask the question of whether it's representative or not. You know, I think we really wanted to engage the community to start exploring what environmental concerns they had and to really um, give them some of the tools to begin to collect their own data. Um, th this really gave us the opportunity to develop a tool that they can use again and again, along with some of the block carbon monitors. So 
we're not looking to be representative. We're looking into engaging the community to address some of the concerns that they may have. I, I might just add again that um, uh, on the disparities issue, um, one of the issues that our group has been very engaged in studying are, um, uh, is the heterogeneity of Asian groups, and we have many in California, and so that there are a number of disparities that are really unrecognized because Asians tend to be lumped into a single category, um, and we don't really pay attention to some of the um, um, individual subgroup issues. And so this was an attempt to work with one particular um, Asian ethnicity that um, actually does have um, a number of certainly occupational risks in terms of some of the predominant occupations, but also um, some um, um, adverse neighborhood um, exposures as well. Okay, well, thank you. We have uh, several additional questions. We'll ask one more now, and we'll save the other question for the end of the session. So our next question is, did, did the community members collect GPS, GIS data on where the measurements were taken, and could they be put into a map so that they could be put into a map? Yes, we had all that information, and, and it has been put in a map. Actually, when we actually went back and presented it, we presented it in a map form for them so they could really see where they went and, and pictures that went along with it, pictures that they took as well as um, aerial pictures of the neighborhood. And part of the objective of that mapping really was from the epidemiologic perspective to then compare some of the observations from these audit surveys to um, other data that are available, for instance, traffic density data that's available for some of these street segments. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Quach, for the interesting presentation and for the answers. We will um, revisit the last question we had received again later in the session. But at this time, I'd like to introduce the speakers for our second presentation, Mr. Wig Zamor and Dr. Christina Fuller. Mr. Zaymore has a master's in real estate development from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. He focuses on the continuum of issues that revolve around urban economic development, regional transportation, environmental quality, and local public health. In short, sustainable development. In Somerville, Massachusetts, he has been an advocate for dense transit-oriented development and a leader in successful campaigns for a new subway stop and two new light rail branches. In 2007 and 2008, after reviewing excess heart attack and lung cancer mortality patterns in Massachusetts, Mr. Zaymore initiated and helped manage pilot scare, scale near highway pollution studies with environmental health and engineering and with Aerodyne Research Incorporated. About the same time, he and other members of the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership approached Doug Brugge of Tufts Medical School seeking collaborative community-based research opportunities. Mr. Zaymore has helped design and steer the Tufts-based community assessment of freeway exposure and health, the CAFE study. Dr. Fuller is a postdoctoral research associate in the Institute of Public Health at Georgia State University. Her research interests include characterization of pollution exposure, environmental epidemiology, environmental justice, and community-engaged research. Her current research is in the area of traffic-related air pollution, specifically ultrafine particles, and its effect on biomarkers of cardiovascular disease. Dr. Fuller has worked as an environmental engineer in Chicago and as an advocate for environmental justice in New York City. She earned a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from Northwestern University and master's and doctoral degrees in environmental health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Mr. Zaymore and Dr. Fuller. Um, this is Wick Zaymore, and I'm going to give the first half of this presentation and then hand it off to Christina for the second half. I'm uh, happy to be included today. I think I'm the civilian representative. So our project is called CAFE, Community Assessment of Freeway Exposures and Health, and it's organized around Interstate 93 and investigates highway pollution gradients and neighborhood cardiovascular health at various distances from the highway. The, 
the second slide shows Interstate 93 going through Somerville with Boston in the background and our largest public housing project on the right. Our funders are lower left. We greatly appreciate the support of NIEHS. And on the right are partners in the project with a few of the field team members uh, in the center bottom. Um, next, I thought I would show you um, the different field years. We had three, three field years in this five-year project of which we have about a half year left to do a final analysis. So lower left, you can see Somerville, uh, which is my community, and uh, Interstate 93 and the various distances of study uh, participants. Lower right, our second year in Dorchester and South Boston. Top right, uh, Chinatown and downtown Boston. And top left, Malden, which we used as a background population for uh, the Chinatown year of study. Uh, this is the only easy slide here, just a reminder that air pollution affects uh, more than just air and more than just people. And now a little bit on the study design. Uh, on the left, lower, we have a very uh, well-equipped mobile laboratory uh, with both particle and gas instruments. And we'll be creating an ultrafine particle model that will give uh, values per hour for every participant for each field year. And then a detailed time activity analysis that came out of surveys. We have blood biomarkers from clinics, including C-reactive protein. And it will all be put through a structural equation model in the hopes that we can get a lot more significance than would uh, come out of a simple proximity analysis. Um, to go through how the community came up with this project, because it originated in Somerville and then extended to Tufts and Tufts uh, longstanding other community partners, we focused first actually on economic development in a community that's mostly residential and lacks jobs and tax base. That led us to focus on regional transportation capacity and supply, and that in turn led us to look at air quality and public health as levers in the public debate. So um, here's Somerville, top left in gray, only four square miles. Um, we pretty much had no uh, clean light rail or subway transportation. But through advocacy of the last uh, decade, we have uh, gotten the state to commit to a billion dollars of new um, subway and light rail transit. Uh, the orange uh, T-stop is in Assembly Square, which is an area we focus on for economic development. The two green lines are the first new light rail projects in Massachusetts in a generation. And the subway stop is also the first in a generation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the economic development, but that's it for the transportation. So this area, Assembly Square, was largely industrial, had a big Ford plant, and largely underutilized. And the bottom, I've, I've tipped the um, orientation 90 degrees to show on the left the original developer's preference, which was largely for waterfront parking lots and big box stores. And on the right, uh, the community preference for dense mixed use, mixed income housing, and uh, a lot of uh, job diversity as well. And uh, we had quite a battle, but ended up uh, with a nice settlement about six years ago that involved uh, taking 50,000 vehicles per day out of what was projected to be 100,000 vehicles per day to and from this area, had a large cash commitment from the developers to transit, uh, and also at the community's desire, ended up with a dense mixed use plan for 10 million square feet, a little bit upside down from traditional NIMBY. Um, and this is a picture of three urban um, multi-story mixed-use blocks underway this year, and also the T-stop, which is underway. All of those will be open in two years. Now to go to the um, environmental health and, and air quality, um, we started to realize that we had a real issue, that it wasn't just a political lever. And so we started to look at the literature and also to do some pilot studies of our own. And to go quickly, of course, Yifang Zhu's 
uh, seminal 2002 work showing that uh, primary pollution gradients from highways did not really relate to PM 2.5 and regional standards. A nice paper by uh, Gail Hagler out of EPA's Mobile Labs group um, showing zero correlation between PM 2.5, PM 10, and ultrafine particles, meaning to us that there was no protection afforded by those NAC standards. And then the first ultrafine model we're aware of, which is in Stockholm, uh, done by, by Gid Hagen. And um, to move on to some of the seminal health studies, we again looked at Stockholm and the Nyberg lung cancer study, which showed that all the statistical significance from air pollution in Stockholm connected with lung cancer was coming from no mobile sources, and it was all coming from the top 10% of exposure. It wasn't coming from an interquartile range. A similar study in Oslo, which I'm not showing, then uh, Mike Jarrett's nice study of Toronto, where proximity uh, alone was not statistically significant, but he got a, a pretty good association of cardiovascular mortality and uh, NO2 as a mobile marker, and again, a much higher relative risk for people closest to the pollution sources. And then finally, a great series of studies in Vancouver by Dan and Brower. Uh, where they found a 450,000 population, uh, very high cardiovascular mortality among the people who lived within 50 meters of the highway, somewhat less uh, for a study of multi-pollutant uh, ranges within the city. That multi-pollutant study um, had black carbon and nitrogen oxides completely eliminating PM 2.5 association with mortality within the city. Um, just to uh, stay on housing for a second, these are pictures on the left of eastern Massachusetts uh, major affordable housing projects and on the right of highway pollution hazards uh, marked by 50 or 100,000 vehicles per day. What you see is that the maps are identical. Our affordable housing is pretty much going in the highest hazard locations, at least in eastern Massachusetts, from an air pollution point of view. Uh, C-reactive protein is an important marker for us. It's a little study by Hertel and Barbara Hoffman in Germany showing um, subchronic uh, 21, 28 days and a little bit less statistical significance for ultrafine particle number count and CRP, but not, not a statistical association with PM2.5 or PM10 in that study. Uh, similar but more complex study from Ralph Delfino with senior citizens in California, again uh, showing a CRP connected with mobile markers, although more uh, black carbon in this case and primary organic carbon from mobile sources. Uh, longer term study from Stockholm by Panasevich, uh, pretty good statistical significance with IL-6 as well as CRP. And then Paul Ritker uh, is one of our team members, but I'm not going to go into this slide. This is what I kind of use as my, my back of the envelope uh, for health effects for people living very close to highways, basically 50 to 100 percent higher uh, cardiovascular heart attack and lung cancer mortality, um, as well as childhood asthma. Um, to move a little bit to a description of the community, these are the cities that surround Boston. Uh, Somerville is the densest city in the, in the state. Chelsea also has a lot of immigrants and a second densest. I often use these two together in presenting to people because of the um, pollution and socio socioeconomic issues. Um, they're quite similar, uh, one and two in uh, density of immigrants, population, multifamily housing, uh, a lot of need for state support per year because of a uh, shortage of jobs, uh, transit largely buses, and very high mobile pollution. The main difference being that Somerville also has a great density of college grads at this point who can contribute some mental energy to some of these issues. As I said, a lot of... Uh, mobile pollution, and when you have a lot of mobile pollution and a dense population, you tend to get a fairly high uh, health effects um, on a per square mile basis. So this is a 
five-year compilation of, of uh, heart attack and lung cancer um, from Massachusetts public data showing the greatest density of excess deaths in, in uh, Somerville and Chelsea. It's not epidemiology, obviously, but it corresponds with the literature. And, um, and, and this uh, was one of the things that spurred us on a little bit. Um, and then just a sample of uh, some of the really good uh, socioeconomic and segregation work that's been done from a large study by uh, Rachel Morella Frosch at Berkeley. Uh, looking at all the census tracts and air toxics, including diesel. Um, some of our pilot studies, uh, we did two um, pretty, pretty um, important studies to us, one with uh, environmental health and engineering that uh, had some good outcomes from time integrated NO2 as a mobile marker. And then on the right, we were fortunate enough to use uh, Aerodyne Research and their uh, really fabulous equipment set to look at a typical winter morning rush hour in Somerville. Uh, some of the results, uh, this is from the NO2 study uh, showing much higher concentrations of mobile pollutants near the highway as would be expected. And um, here's a, just a graph off the highway uh, center on the left showing how steep that time integrated NO2 signal is. And then here a nice paper uh, we got from the Aerodyne work in atmospheric chemistry and physics on the right showing especially early morning very steep gradients of ultrafines, nitrogen oxides, and other primary mobile pollutants. So we took these to Tufts and, um, and uh, got together with their community-based participatory research group run by Doug Brugie. This is a picture of, of the CAFE mobile lab and uh, two of the grad students that have worked on it. On the left is Allison Patton, who's got the arduous task of creating the ultrafine particle um, model, and that's pretty, pretty well underway. Here is one year of results from 55 representative days of monitoring. In the center of each of these panels is Interstate 93, and you can see the gradients in either direction for the full year top left. Uh, by season top right, the colder weather has, has stronger primary pollution gradients. On the bottom left is um, day of week uh, Sunday. We don't have a lot of sampling. Uh, and then bottom right is different times of day. And uh, what you see especially is a pretty steep drop off on the right hand side, which is downwind. Uh, left hand side is more center city in Somerville. Um, where we're going from here, kind of under the cafe umbrella, we have two sibling studies. We have a sub study that's part of a large Puerto Rican health study, uh, and the sub study is looking at mobile pollution and cardiovascular outcomes. On the right, we have uh, a HUD-funded pilot study of HEPA filter intervention in Mystic Housing residences right next to Interstate 93 to see if we can lower indoor pollution and cardiovascular inflammatory biomarkers. And then, of course, on the bottom, what remains the hard analytic work from CAFE, and I think that uh, Christina is going to talk a little bit about that, namely integrating the ultrafine particle model, a time activity, and the structural equation model. And just to show you, we have very detailed time activity for all of our participants, the red being residential. In the top, the purple is full-time students or workers. The bottom is more retirees, and also time on highway and that kind of thing. And two concluding slides. From the community point of view, the quandary is that we think the, the, the science is already there, that there's uh, very high relative risk of, of mortality and morbidity for people who live uh, and spend a lot of time next to highways. Um, but in the absence of some federal authority declaring this to be a hazard and getting that message out to both the public and policymakers, it's going to be very high, hard outside of some places like California with their own science and policy to really start to design healthy cities. And we all know that cities are among the healthiest places on earth but we really should be designing them in ways that will be healthy for a much longer time. Our infrastructure and our buildings last a long time, and, and we really can't afford to 
throw another generation in the dumpster on these issues. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Zamor. Dr. Fuller? Thank you, Wig, for starting, starting off our presentation. I just wanted to highlight more about um, CAFE, that is being a five-year cross-sectional study of ultrafine particles near highways and mar markers of inflammation and blood pressure, which is cardiovascular health. And Wig and I would both be happy to answer any additional questions about how the study was structured and how we were able to make it a community-based project at the end. But actually right now I'm going to discuss more about the preliminary results that we've had. So there are three areas including the CAFE study as Wig mentioned, Somerville, South Boston and Dorchester in Chinatown and Malden. And here are more detailed maps of the study areas to which I will be referring in this presentation, Somerville and South Boston, Dorchester. If you recall, the final analyses will use modeled hourly ultrafine particle concentrations as a measure of exposure and a structural equation model of health effects. And leading up to the full analysis, we have examined health effects in our population with exposure measured in ways commonly used in the literature. By this, I would mean using central site data to look at acute exposures and proximity data to look at chronic exposures. And by doing these preliminary analyses, we can elucidate the factors important to consider in our SEM and also to have points of comparison for the full model. So in the Somerville sample of 142 people, we looked at acute to subacute effects associated with exposure to ultrafine particle concentrations that were measured at a distant site that was located in Boston, about seven kilometers from our, from our study area, which is an exposure that has been used in past epidemiological studies. And what this shows on the left-hand side are some characteristics of the Somerville population. And on the right-hand side are box plots showing our exposure measurements, lags of zero, one, and two days, and moving averages of three up to 28 days. On the y-axis are the percent increases in both IL-6 and C-reactive protein. And their estimates of the effect are for 5,000 particles per cubic centimeter increase in ultrafine particles. And what you can see is that for IL-6, there's a 15% increase in IL-6 for a three-day moving average up to the highest effect estimate, which was 91% increase for a 28-day moving average. C-reactive protein was similar, with the highest effect estimates being 74% increase for a 28-day moving average. And although our effect estimates are larger than previous studies, possibly due to the imposition of our measurements, as you can see by the wide confidence intervals, which is not surprising based on the modest sample size, we're just using our Somerville population. In CAFE, we have a rich data set of personal characteristics. And although it is difficult to see differences in this modest sample size, there are some factors that warrant further exploration in the full SCM model. There is a suggestion that diabetes increases the effect of ultrafine particles on IL-6, as you can see from the box plot to the left. And also BMI greater than 30 may increase effect estimates of exposure to CRP and possibly dampen response in IL-6. As we look at longer time periods of exposure, our longest being 28 days, we become more interested in factors that may change chronic exposure, since 28 days is pretty much a, a subacute near chronic exposure. And one chronic exposure uh, factor that we're interested in is distance to roadway. So this table highlights annual household income and education, which may be expected to result in health disparities and has done so in past studies. And so what I highlighted here our household income broken down by just as a highway less than 100 meters, 100 to 400 meters, and greater than 1,000 meters. And our background 
area, which is greater than 1,000 meters. The population that has an income less than $16,499 is only 2% of that population. However, in our 100 to 400 meter group, it's 38%, and then 100 meters is actually 15%. When you look down at 100,000, you see that there's higher income people in our urban background neighborhood and fewer percentages at that income level in the near to highway locations. Our subsequent analysis of chronic exposure included both Somerville and Dorchester and South Boston neighborhoods. The distance for this analysis was broken down into five distance bins, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. And this bar graph shows CRP and IL-6 levels by distance to highway. All distance groups had an average CRP exceeding three milligrams per liter, which would be categorized as an elevated risk. And CRP was highest in the 150 to 250 meter group followed by the zero to 50 in 250 to 450 meter group. A particular note is how similar the CRP and IL-6 values are between the 50 and 150 meter group and the urban background. And some of the demographic and health measure variables were actually similar between those two groups. But what we're really interested in is how much CRP levels and the exposed distance groups, which we define as 100 to 400 meters, how they differ from the urban background. And when we analyze the data by restricting it to each study area, we discover that there are some differences. What this map is showing is the percent difference in CRP levels between each of the exposed distance groups compared to the urban background. And those percent differences are represented by the color, the color scheme with white being less than the urban background and the lightest blue being zero to 50% difference and up from there. So what we see in Somerville is that all the distance groups have a percent CRP difference greater than the urban background, with the highest difference being between the urban background and the zero to 50 and 150 to 250 meter groups. But when we look at Dorchester and South Boston, we see a very different picture. We're only the zero to 50 and 150 meter groups have a CRP percent difference above the urban background. It's a much flatter slope. When we look at IL-6, we see again that there's a difference in the patterns compared to the urban background by study area. For Somerville, IL-6 of all distance categories have positive associations with the two furthest exposed groups containing a significant percent difference. When we examine the Dorchester South Boston map, we see that the percent difference is pretty flat across the exposed distance groups, with the 0 to 50 meter group containing the largest percent difference compared to the urban background. So we have hypothesized some potential reasons for the disparate findings between these two study areas. And one of them is that the urban background comparison group in Dorchester and South Boston has a number of participants that live adjacent to Dorchester Avenue, which you can see in the, in the figure to the right going north and south. And that is a significant source of ultrafine particles. However, when you look in Somerville, there's a road called Broadway, and there are no study participants that live very close to that highway. This shows, again, disparities in the chronic effects. So pretty much, you look at the combined association for IL-6 at the bottom is CRP at the top, and you can see associations with distance to the highway compared to the urban background. When you break them out into Somerville versus South Boston, Dorchester, you see that the associations are different depending on the study area and also depending on other factors such as obesity, how we recruited our sample, random inconvenience, and being on one or other side of the highway, but those are not quite as clear. So in summary, 
With our Q analysis, we do see an increasing trend in effect for IL-6 and CRP with increasing ultrafine particle concentrations, and that diabetes and BMI may play a factor. We also see chronic associations as well, but there is a lot of variation depending on things like personal characteristics like BMI or exposure characteristics such as time activity. Now I'm going to turn more to talk about how variability in exposure due to ambient or indoor concentrations or time activity can change the associations that we find. So to examine this more, we looked at data from Somerville and collected particle number concentrations as our proxy for ultrafine particles. So we had instruments monitoring at fixed sites um, the, they are represented here by BBB, which is one site. MAC, Mystic Activity Center, is another site, both in the study area. And then a central distance site, SPH, for the School of Public Health that was in Boston. We did long-term monitoring there for a year. And then at a selection of 18 homes within Somerville, we collected one to two weeks of monitoring there. So this table shows four models of outdoor residential ultrafine particles. For the first two lines you see, the asterisk represents the percent increase in the residential outdoor ultrafine particles for a 10% increase in the fixed site ultrafine particles. Here the first line is the School of Public Health, that's the distance site, and the second line, the Mystic Activity Center, is the near highway site. And what it shows is that more ultrafine particle variation at homes in the study area were explained by variation at the near highway site as, composed, as opposed to the central site. And one of the take home points is that near highway populations may be a vulnerable population. Using only central site data or proximity may not sufficiently capture these exposure variations for people who live close to highways. In addition, people spend the majority of their time indoors, and it's important to evaluate the representativeness of ambient concentration when people spend most of their time indoors. So using our monitored data, we looked at this as well. And what this shows in a nutshell is that there's evidence that highway ultrafine particle easily migrates indoors because overall indoor-outdoor ratios were close to one, although there was significant variation throughout the day and between homes. This is representative of during warm periods in this community, so that's the only time where we took these measurements. So next, there are several factors that impact the indoor ultrafine particle concentrations. And those include the outdoor concentrations were the largest predictor of what's indoors, but also other factors such as air conditioning, time of day, and meteorology. And what I have here is a time series plot of data from two houses, the one on top, which did not have central air conditioning, and the one bottom that used air con central air conditioning, just to illustrate how air conditioning can modify infiltration of ambient particles indoors. And to revisit the CAFE diagram, which we showed at the very beginning of the plan for spatial temporal modeling of ultrafine particle concentrations to look at our health effects. We see that each neighborhood is different in population and also in pollution landscape, which can lead to differences in health effects. And some do not exactly fit what we may expect to find in terms of demographic information or near highway concentrations. Central site monitors may not adequately capture exposures present near highways for pollutants with large interurban variation, which may lead to exposure misclassification. And therefore, we conclude that detailed exposure data and knowledge of population characteristics are really necessary for us to understand fully association between ultrafine particles and cardiovascular health, and will also give us the ability to highlight 
some of the underlying health disparities in a diverse data set. So that's the last slide, and we'd like to, again, acknowledge our funders and also the CAFE partners and community participants. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. We do have a question already. Have there, has there been any attempt to use buffer zones or anti-idling ordinances for trucks in order to improve the air quality in the area? Uh, yes, there is an anti-idling law in Massachusetts. It's not always upheld, but there have been some interesting uh, forays by uh, students, uh, junior high school students, high school students, uh, giving out tickets and bringing awareness to the issue. There's also another group in Boston which focuses on diesel pollution, and they've got uh, quite a good campaign going in the city of Boston with regard to construction uh, equipment, which is another large urban source. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question uh, for the first two speakers, Peggy and Tu, that we weren't able to ask earlier. What policy change or change in public health do you expect to achieve from the program? What did the communities request in terms of changing the environmental health of their neighborhoods? This is Tu. Um, I will first want to say that you know, a lot of the work that we were doing was very developmental, that we were just starting off in this. Um, however, when we presented at the different community forums, um, the, the community had organized to bring out some of the politicians to show some of this. One of the, the issues that Peggy highlighted was what we found in Marin County, was that a lot of the Vietnamese living there actually lived in an area called, the, what they call the canal area. And uh, they, there was a lot of Vietnamese and Latino population there. And they really brought up um, issues around um, air quality as well as um, some of the racial uh, tension. And, you know, during the presentation of some of this, they had um, voiced some of their concerns to some of the policy decision makers um, at the community forum. So there, this is just the beginning of the community getting engaged in issues around environmental health. And so we are still in discussions about what we want to do next with it. Um, I, I would just add that it's also very relevant to the, um, the very impressive and extensive work that you've seen in the second presentation, because one of the um, uh, major concerns in the uh, Alameda County uh, group had to do with uh, traffic um, and there is actually uh, concern about uh, creating a new freeway off-ramp in the Chinatown area, which would even furthermore impact um, exposures in that area. And so they, um, um, our colleagues at Asian Health Services have seen this also as a valuable way to collect some um, both qualitative and quantitative data to inform the um, uh, the debates that are going on right now on that issue. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that um, there, we're in the process of discussing with Asian Health Services and some of their other community allies on um, providing the audit tool as well as the block carbon monitors and then working with others to secure a particular matter um, monitor for um, community members to uh, conduct the same audits around neighborhoods where they want to put the off-ramp and then the other areas. So we are continuing to do research and collecting data that would inform some of the um, work that the community is doing and organizing around for, for local policies. Mm -hmm. And again, these, many of these are issues that have initiated with the community. So. In that partnership, they have primary ownership of a lot of them. Thank you so much for that uh, very comprehensive answer. We have a, another question for the second two speakers. They're uh, asking, when will the Boston study be published? We've probably got about uh, four papers out there in various pieces. Um, Christina has a recent paper in atmospheric environment, and we put the uh, Somerville um, year in atmospheric environment as well. Um, I think that our analysis is going to take um, another half year at least before we can get out some comprehensive um, conclusions. And of course, we've got our fingers crossed that the original hypothesis of getting detailed um, personal exposure over the course of a year plus, um, plus the time activity 
and the use of the structural equation model will, will produce results that are clearer than um, the small uh, short pieces that we've put out using kind of more, more traditional and um, less accurate um, uh, methods to date. But we wanted to get going on some things um, to, to guide the fuller analysis. So that's why, why we've proceeded that way. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for participating in today's session. Before we close, I'd like to make a few announcements. Your feedback is very important. After today's webinar, please take a moment to fill out the short evaluation form. Your feedback is really vital to helping us ensure that we're providing the highest quality speakers and information to meet your needs. Please keep in touch with PAPH with the listserv and the PEPH e-news. Sign up today by emailing peph at niehs.nih. Gov on, on your screen now. Upcoming webinars. Um, at the end of October, we have plans for a webinar focusing on children's environmental health and information about that and other upcoming webinars, as well as the registration links, will be on the PEPH events page as soon as they are available. The events page is shown here on the screen. And we really want to thank once again to all our presenters for your most interesting presentations today, Dr. Peggy Reynolds, Dr. Tu Quach, Mr. Wig Zaymore, and Dr. Christina Fuller. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for participating.